In 1963, Sonny Werblin bought a football team. In 1965, he bought a legend. You know, uh, these people here, your future coach and the owner, Mr. Werblin, have uh, referred to you as the greatest football player in college this year. Uh, you haven't even put on a jet uniform yet. Uh, you already feel a little bit of pressure? Well, uh, pressure just makes it go all the more. Uh -huh. I kind of like pressure a little bit. Mr. Werblin, you're the man that's given all this money. We don't know the exact figures, but... Uh, well, you're not going to know it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, how, 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 what kind of an estimate? Or what uh, can you tell us about it? Well, Bob, all I can say is that we think it's, it's a lot of money, but it's commensurate with uh, his ability. The price to sign Joe Namath was $427,000. An outrageous sum in those days, especially for a player in need of knee surgery before he ever played a down. After my first operation, Jim Nicholas, the Jets head orthopedist, said, Joe, the operation went well. We think you can play four years. And I was just, thank you, Lord, you know, and, uh, but it hurt, and, and, and I had trust in the doctors, so I didn't question uh, my ability to be able to play. I just knew that I had to suck it up. Growing up, Namath modeled himself after the Colts quarterback number 19, Johnny Unitas. But while Unitas combined a clean-cut approach with a quiet confidence, Namath proved to be bold with a brash disposition to match. I remember one time at a table with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Werblin at the Four Seasons, and I was so upset because something had been written about our team, about me, and I was just ready to call it, you know, I said, this is ridiculous. And Mrs. Werblin just chuckled. She said, Joseph, it's show business. I said, no, it's not. It's football. This is football. It's not show business. She said, Joey, it's show business. And you know, that has stayed with me since. Joe Namath in Beauty Mist Pantyhose? Yes. We did it to prove that Beauty Mist can make any legs look like a million dollars. Now, I don't wear pantyhose, but if Beauty Mist can make my legs look good, imagine what they'll do for yours. <laughs> and so, Broadway Joe was born. He was an instant celebrity. He attracted attention everywhere he went, especially from opposing defenses. I believe it was on Thursdays, they would uh, drain each knee, and then Joe would be so, kind of stiff for a half a day or a day. And then uh, all of a sudden, come Sunday, everybody got well. <laughs> he was tough, really tough. I mean, he wouldn't succumb to anybody. I mean, he'd look him in the face, and these guys were out to get him. The team that caused Namath the most pain was the Oakland Raiders. In the second-to-last game of 1967, defensive end Ike Lassiter broke his cheekbone. Namath continued to play and refused to acknowledge the injury, even when questioned by the media. After the game, they told me, you know, what happened to your face or whatever, and I told him, uh, you know, I, I had bitten to a, a bad steak in the morning, a hard steak, and I hurt my damn day. I wouldn't give any satisfaction to the opponents. I mean, under any circumstances. The next week, Namath became the first quarterback in pro football history to throw for 4,000 yards in a season. The legend of Broadway Joe was growing on and off the field, but at least one Jet refused to bend over backwards to embrace it. Jerry Philbin, number 81, was the Jets' starting defensive end and the team's best pass rusher. He struck fear into opposing quarterbacks and wanted desperately to tear into his own. We had all the respect for Joe as a quarterback, but all he did is have yes people around him, and he had no one to control him, no one to tell him he was hurting the team by his image. <laughs> and he was hurting me 
in my living because he was taking money out of my pocket because we didn't get to the championship in 67, which we should have. In 1967, Namath may have thrown for 4,000 yards, but he also had 28 interceptions. He misfired six times in a 28-28 tie to the Oilers that ultimately cost the Jets the division title. In another game, Namath almost failed to show altogether. He came in 10 minutes before the game, all disheveled. You knew he had been out all night long. And I called him a prima donna. Walt Michaels threatened if we didn't win the game, he was in trouble. There was a big episode in the locker room. We won the game. He went out and had a good game. And so there were two sets of rules that were created, one for Joe and one for everybody else. And Joe played on that. It seems almost un-American to me for a bachelor not to, you know, go around uh, having a drink with a lady now and then. And why all of a sudden that's become an evil in me, uh, I don't know. But some people don't like it. Well, you can't please any everybody. Uh, I'm just uh, <laughs> trying to get along, you know, just, <laughs> just trying to get by. Look at that shot. Joe had to change his ways, and we we're all ready now to bring it to management and let them know about it. But they knew it. And so the following year, they, they came to the players and they said, look, you got to get Joe elected captain. You got to make him captain because you got to give him some responsibility. When he gets this responsibility, he'll show that leadership. At the start of the 1968 season, for the first time since becoming a Jet, Namath was elected offensive captain. It was a stunning, uh, stunning feeling, you know, uh, one that uh, to this day I cherish more than any kind of accolades or whatever things that, that's happened. Joe, to this day, thinks that he was elected because he was a leader. It was the complete opposite why we elected him captain, because he didn't have the leadership. He needed the responsibility. In 1968, Namath became more than just a captain. He became the catalyst behind a championship run that changed the game of pro football forever. The former number one overall pick of the 2002 draft is now officially a backup quarterback. On Friday, David Carr agreed to terms with the Carolina Panthers. He gets a two-year deal, which according to Adam Schefter, is worth over $6 million. And the NFL has confirmed that Ricky Williams has officially applied for reinstatement to the Miami Dolphins. April 27th will make it a full year that Williams has been suspended from the league. Williams spoke exclusively with NFL Total Access in an interview you can see on Monday's show. In fact, you can get a sneak peek of that interview on NFL.com. And future Hall of Famer Michael Irvin, well, I guess he showed why he didn't play quarterback. Look at his first pitch at the Texas Rangers home opener, high on the first base side of the plate. The former Cowboy receiver got a standing ovation from the 40,000 fans that were in attendance. This is NFL Network Now. In 1958, Don Maynard was drafted by the New York Giants. That season, the Giants faced coach Weeb Eubank, Johnny Unitas, and the Baltimore Colts in the NFL championship game. It doesn't pay you any extra money, but the first guy to ever receive a kickoff in an overtime game was me. The return would be Maynard's last as a Giant. The following year, he was released from the team. I was a young guy, and and uh, a lot of times I think about it occasionally. Uh, you know, I was devastated. In 1960, Maynard became the first player signed by the New York Titans of the AFL. Three years later, the Titans became the Jets, and Eubank became the head coach and general manager. Eubank began overhauling the team, and Maynard's job was again in jeopardy. First year when they came in, they, they started getting on my case about do this, do that. And so the next year when I came to camp, I said, I need to talk to you and all the other coaches. And I said, I don't need anybody to chew me out about anything. I said, I train as good as anybody in pro football. And I said, I don't drop passes and I don't run wrong patterns. Y'all trade me, cut me, 
or don't say another word to me as long as I'm here. And uh, I was probably emotional pretty good about the situation. <clears throat> and then I said, I'm walking out the door and y'all make up your minds. The Jets gave Maynard a new contract, but his frugal ways remained. He lived in New York from Texas. He never bought a winter coat, never had an overcoat living in New York. Now, I was tight, but we was cheap. I was negotiating with him one time, and he never looks at you. He just writes a figure on the pad, and he pushes it over to you and said, How about that? I said, Oh, gee, we equipment guy makes more money than that. And then he writes another, and he pushes it out to you and said, How about that? And I said, Oh, gee, we the taxi drivers make more than that. Finally, you sign, you know, and he jumps up out of his chair, and he puts his hand across, and he wants to shake hands with you. said... Glad to have you with us. Now, don't tell anybody what you're making. I said, I won't weeb. I'm just ashamed of it as you are. <laughs> when Joe Namath arrived in 1965, Maynard was the first to greet him. Joseph, I always called him. I said, I'm going to make you a better quarterback, and you're going to make me a great receiver. But I said, we're going to talk on every play, every route ahead of time. You don't think it has to be that much on the money? No, I mean, I don't think he has to lead it to the sideline that much. And we're going to have the timing down so good that you can throw him blindfolded and you'll never miss it. The AFL's most feared tandem became Namath to Maynard. Namath and Maynard developed such a strong connection that when Eubank tried to help, he often did more harm than good. That'll bring the middle guard out, out of the middle, and he goes through there. Slot, you mean double slot? Double slot. <laughs> we would send in a couple of plays, you know, and Joe got both of them interception. I'm sure they're over shift. All right, well, you are 19. I don't care. No, 119. 119, I think would be good. And I said, Joseph, I said, don't listen to him anymore. I said, you know, on game day, he could, he needs to be home. We just went with a check with me about 80% of the time, 75% of the time, and called plays in the huddle the other 20, 25% of the time, and then if they weren't where we thought they should be, we'd audibleize off. As he called it, and I got the signal, if I didn't want it, well, then I gave him my signal. And we only had one busted play in nine years, and that's the first game Joe played in. In the 1968 season opener, Namath's bombs to Maynard torched one of the league's best defenses. The following week, the offensive onslaught continued. Through two weeks, Namath and the offense could do no wrong, but it wouldn't last. Namath's inconsistent play would return and threaten to ruin the jet season. I remember it being the second day of draft, getting phone calls saying, if you're gonna be our next pick, get ready. We're thinking about drafting you. And uh, watching the pick come up and pass by and just the pain that you feel with every, with every call that goes like that. But once you finally get the call, the excitement you have, you know you finally get your chance at your dream, and hopefully you'll make the best of it. The NFL Draft, live on NFL Network. The Jets' 1968 road to a championship hit a detour in Buffalo, a place that had special meaning for defensive end Jerry Philbin. I went to the University of Buffalo, and, and I had a vendetta going against the uh, Buffalo Bills because they didn't draft me out of college. They thought I was too small. I couldn't make it in the, um, on their team. So I was always really, really up for the Buffalo Bills. My roommate drives me to the airport. He's an ex-ball player. He says, Joe, gosh, you guys are 19 points favored. What do you think of that? I said, well, we got the best defense in the league. I don't know how they can score. Hmm.
five interceptions. Three were returned for touchdowns, and the Jets suffered a stunning defeat. Philbin's always got some great lines. And when we got ready to leave, uh, Philbin stood up and said, uh, Namath, this week we're wearing green. Philbin's remark paled in comparison to the tongue lashing Namath received on the flight home. Walt Michaels, our defensive coordinator, sends for me to come up and sit down and talk to him. And I went up and I sat down with Mike, or with uh, Walt, and I could feel the heat coming from that chair. He was seething. I mean, he was, and he's no linebacker, you know. Walt was seething, and he uh, explained to me that we had the best defense in the league, that Buffalo had a rookie quarterback. What in the heck were we doing offensively trying to do that? And you know what? I agreed with him. I agreed with him. I agreed with everything he said. He was right. The next week against San Diego, Namath chose a cautious approach that did not throw an interception. Still, the Jets trailed the Chargers by four with five minutes left. Namath marched the team to the Chargers one, where the Jets faced fourth and goal. Namath calls it, the crowd standing, and here's a handoff. In the final minute, quarterback John Hadle drove the Chargers into field goal range. Instead of playing for the tie, San Diego tried to beat Johnny Sample deep for the win. Hadle, hurried by Philbin, rushed his throw. Sample intercepted, and the Jets won the game. Jets appeared to be back on a winning track, but old habits die hard. 19-point favorites against Denver, Namath again threw five interceptions. In the final seconds, Namath had a chance to salvage a tie. The loss dropped the Jets to three and two. We should have won this game handily. Joe Namath went out and had his worst game ever. Even after the game, he said that he stunk, and he did stink. Namath had regressed, and defensive coordinator Walt Michaels was furious. Instead of again confronting Namath, Michaels met with the one player he knew could get Namath's attention, number 22, Jim Hudson. Hudson was Michaels' starting safety, but more importantly, he was Namath's best friend on the team. The thing that changed, I think, our whole season, Walt Michaels went to Jim Hudson after that game and said, you've got to talk to Joe. You've got to tell him to take the pressure off himself. Put it on the defense. We've got a great defense. Let the defense make the opponent make the mistakes. And you know something? Joe heeded that advice. We had a team for once. We had a team, and the momentum was really on the way. Against the Oilers, the Jets trailed by one with less than five minutes to play. Namath drove the Jets 80 yards for the go-ahead touchdown. On the ensuing kickoff, Philpin's hit sealed the victory. In the next three games, the winning formula stuck. The AFL's number one defense continued to force turnovers. Namath sacrificed for the good of the team. He threw for less than 200 yards and did not have a touchdown pass in four straight games. The Jets won all four. The Jets were now 7-2, and two, and the lesson was clear. What they needed to become champions was not just Namath's arm, but his head and his heart. 
In week 10, Joe Namath faced the team that broke his cheekbone one year earlier, the Oakland Raiders. There was a lot of anger on our team, uh, and a lot of anger in the Oakland Raiders team. We just didn't like each other, I guess. And Oakland, who was always thought of as the most uh, penalized team, and they were, uh, we went in there, and all, all of a sudden, we were the most penalized team. The Jets were flagged 13 times, and safety Jim Hudson was ejected. When he came out, he gave the sign to the whole stand at Oakland. Both hands. He, he, gave, he gave him the bird. Gee whiz, and here comes the paper cups and everything else. The Jets continued to lose players. The best passing combination in the league made up for it. Joe Namath threw for a season-high 381 yards. Don Maynard had 228 yards receiving, a franchise record that still stands. With 65 seconds left, the Jets took the lead. What happened next will always be remembered as a landmark moment in the history of televised sports. Oakland went on offense as the clock struck 7 o'clock Eastern time. NBC on the East Coast switched away from the game to show the movie Heidi. The Raiders then beat Hudson's replacement, Mike D'Amato, for the go-ahead score. On the ensuing kickoff, the Raiders scored again. Two touchdowns in nine seconds. The Jets had lost, and the coaches were furious. The officials have their own room, and it was right next door to the uh, visiting team's uh, locker. Walt Michaels was accusing him of getting paid off by Al Davis, and so he was banging down the doors and, and just yelling all these crazy things. But no one was angrier than Jets fans who saw this instead of this. Monica to Charlie Smith. Smith is hitting, and he scores! There were 10,000 phone calls of complaint to New York NBC alone. So many, the telephone switchboards blew out their fuses. NBC apologized for the error, but by then, Oakland had scored two touchdowns in the last minute at beaten New York. The game was over. The fans who missed it could not be consoled. The Jets would rebound from the defeat and would not lose another game for the rest of the season. The Jets closed out the 1968 season with four decisive wins. They finished 11-3 and, and won the AFL Eastern Division by four games. The Riders named Joe Namath MVP of the offense and Jerry Philbin MVP of the defense. By the end of the season, the two honorees were able to laugh at matters that once divided them. And Joe, again, our congratulations. And on behalf of the Metropolitan Football Writers, they are presenting this watch to you, which uh, I know you will wear and take good care of and be on all team meetings on time because of. <laughs> the Jets' opponent in the AFL championship game would be decided by a playoff between the 12 and 2 Raiders and the 12 and 2 Chiefs. I dislike Oakland and Kansas City so much, I always hope they play each other and kill each other off, you know. <laughs> it was a slaughter. But the only casualty was the Chiefs. Darrell LaMonica threw five touchdowns in a 41 6 thrashing. Were you surprised that Oakland beat Kansas City as handily as they did? Well, <laughs> I sure was. That's the way I wanted it personally. I just as soon play uh, Oakland. I uh, always felt that Oakland's defense wasn't quite as strong as Kansas City's defense. So I would rather, offensively speaking, play against Oakland. Uh, I hope this doesn't haunt me after the game <laughs> Sunday. Uh, 
But I was a little worried about Oakland's powerful offense. If Lamonic is hot like he was uh, against Kansas City, it could be a tough day for our defense. But we do have the best defense in the league, and uh, if we play our game the way we've been playing all year long offensively and defensively, I think we'll come out on top. The Super Bowl, to me, was an easy game. The only pressure game I had was the AFL championship. That's the game you got to win to get to the Super Bowl. The weather for the championship game was foul. I mean, it was foul. The field was frozen and lumpy, and the wind was gusting to like 40 miles an hour. I mean, it was heavy wind. The wind was one problem. The Raiders' defense was another. Some of the hits Namath took were legal, some weren't. The first half was a rough half, physically. Physically. Again, the Raiders had injured him. His finger was dislocated, and the constant pounding had taken a toll. You get smelling salts, you snap back too. The rest of you feels all right. And if you can get back to the moment, then you go. Namath again showed his trademark toughness and never missed a snap. Namath back to pass on second down. Throws for the end zone. Touchdown for Maynard. The Jets brought a four-point lead into the fourth quarter. Namath called for Maynard to again run the square out to the sideline. The wind was blowing unbelievable, and the wind caught it. It is intercepted by Atkinson at the 30, down to the 25, the 20. He's down to the 10, the 5, and he is not going to bounds. Joe's always been a football player, and he just didn't give a good tackle. Boy, I mean, he nailed the guy. Namath was in pain. But failing to complete the pass to Maynard hurt even more. Even when he crowds, it's oh, good. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was about to tell you, I guess in the films it looks good. Oh, well, Even though he's crowding, because he's not looking at me. For the first time in the game, the Raiders went ahead. Namath's interception had given away the lead. His best receiver knew how to get it back. I said, Joe, I got a long one when you need it. I told the team uh, that I was going to call one play, but be alert for the audible that I'd go to if Maynard's situation presented itself. In other words, if the DB Atkinson climbed up in a bump and run. We got up there, boy, and sure enough, Atkinson climbed up on Don. Check to the audible. Wonderful protection. Namath dropping back to pass. He is looking. He is going to throw long for Don Maynard. And Maynard makes the pass. Well to the 10. And he is dumped out of bounds on the 8-yard line. A great over-the-shoulder catch. Don Maynard against George Atkinson. It was. It's the greatest catch I ever made. And don't run it back because I might miss it. With the go-ahead score and reach, Namath showed his maturity as a quarterback by remaining patient. Namath looking for the end zone, throwing touchdown to Maynard! John Namath throwing to Don Maynard! He was not the intended original receiver. Namath was looking to his left toward George Sauer, had time to change, look completely across the field to Don Maynard. I knew the Raiders as a ball club, they they don't ever give up. And you got LaMonica behind the center, and, and here they come. Defense, just keep it poised now. Keep it poised. Don't hit it late or anything. No penalties. Six weeks after the Heidi game, the Raiders stood 12 yards away from another miracle comeback. But this time, the winds of fortune and of Shea Stadium were at the Jets' back. 
2.20 to play. First and 10 of the New York 13. LaMonica back to pass. Rookie throwing a swing pass behind. He threw the ball behind Charlie Smith. It's covered by the Jets. That was a lateral pass. It was not a forward pass. We are going to Super Bowl. When Namath signed and underwent knee surgery, the Jets' doctors gave him four years. Four years was all it took. The Jets were AFL champions. Did you think would come this quick? Absolutely. This quick. Four years. You know, you'd think it took a long time coming. Four years. You want to win every year. First year on. Winning. Nothing else matters to me. Winning. Whether well, I catch one or ten. Nothing else matters. We celebrated like it was a Super Bowl afterwards. We were throwing champagne around like it was crazy. It was just unbelievable. Do you know your entire life as an athlete, you're wanting to win a championship, whatever level it's on. And here we were going for the main, the world championship. I said, well, men, we all going to get the loser's share. All you got to do is go out there and play a little extra and you can get the winner's share. And then there's always those guys that says, oh, I want that ring. I want that ring. And my, my comment, I care less about a ring. I want the $15,000. The first two Super Bowls were won by the NFL's Green Bay Packers. They overwhelmed their AFL opponent and validated the perceived superiority of their league. The NFL representative in Super Bowl III was expected to do the same. Odds makers have the Baltimore Colts as anywhere from 17 to 22 point favorites. Some were calling the Colts the greatest team ever assembled. They outscored their opponents by more than 18 points per game, still a record in the Super Bowl era. Johnny Unitas was injured, but in his absence, quarterback Earl Morrill won the league MVP. Morrill's favorite receiver, John Mackey, was one of the best tight ends ever to play the game. In the NFL championship game at Cleveland, the Colts humiliated the only team all year to beat them. None of this impressed Joe Namath. I think uh, Monica throws better than Morrill. Namath would list five AFL quarterbacks he thought were better than the NFL's reigning MVP. Then, at the Miami Touchdown Club, he would say the words that will forever live in pro football lore. I didn't realize I had even said it, first of all. You know, there was a wise guy in the back of the room that started this business, and I just told him what I felt. You know, we're going to win the game, I guarantee you. One guy picked up on it, I believe, and that was Edwin Pope from the Miami Herald. And I didn't know about it till the next day when we, Coach Eubanks, said, we got to have a meeting. <laughs> and I apologized to Coach Eubank and everything and then turned it around, kind of. I said, but, Coach, you know it's your fault. We said, what? what? What do you mean? I said, well, gee whiz, Coach, you've given us all this confidence. You know, you're telling us we're going to win. I mean, I believe you. We're going to win this game. Namath believed in his team and his conviction was contagious. Even one of his harshest critics was convinced Namath would lead the Jets to victory. When he guaranteed that, he meant it. And you know, that really meant something to me as a player and to the defense and to the offense. You got a quarterback that's this tough. He can back up what he says with the football. Believe me, he can back it up. Going back and forth, the offense and defensive guys kind of talk how things going. Says, "Well, we we're going to score good. We're going to be all right. We're going to be balanced." And the, and the defensive guy said, "Well, we're going to intercept four four passes." I said, "Well, that's great. That'll help out." <laughs> Moments before kickoff, the only voices Namath heard were the ones inside his head. You try to keep yourself focused and think of your job, but. When we were getting ready to walk out as captains for the coin flip, I looked across the field and I saw Johnny and I saw those uniforms. I kind of, for the first time, separated myself from right there and just looked and went back home to Beaver Falls and just had all these flashes about yesteryear and where we were right then. This is it. This was it. Well, you've all read and heard all kinds of pregame dope during the week. 
I think one big sidelight has been Joe Namath. Joe Namath, of course, is the man that the Colts have to stop. But Namath has not been bashful this week. He has downgraded quarterback Earl Morrow. And he has said that the Jets are going to win. He doesn't even predict it. He said, I guarantee a Jet victory. Attitude is a whole lot in life. And I had a terrific attitude about that game, and I believe our team did too. The other side may have thought they were ready. They weren't ready. They should have been very upset that Joe guaranteed the game. If they were as good as what they said they were, they should have came out and beat the shit out of us. They didn't do it. Five times the Colts threatened in the first half. All five times they failed to score. going to see some of the things we were doing in those days the AFL was doing. We confused them. The Jets' offense hoped to frustrate Colts defensive end Bubba Smith. Number 67 tackle Dave Herman was in charge of blocking him. Bubba was uh, the best defensive end going at that time. I mean, he was a giant. He was quick. He was strong. He was aggressive. You know, he had all the tools. Herman would have nightmares, literally. Knocked his wife out of the bed, that kind of stuff, man. He's got, he's got to block Bubba, you know. Dave stayed in his chest all day long. Namath received great protection, but his weapons were limited. Don Maynard was hampered by a sore hamstring. I had the injury that people supposedly knew about, but maybe after the Oakland game, everybody thought maybe I was completely well. Didn't want Baltimore to know anything. Coach Eubank didn't want Baltimore to know anything. Rather than altering their game plan, the Jets sent Maynard deep early. The pass did not connect, but the play had served its purpose. They doubled Maynard every play, which left Snell, Boozer, Mathis, uh, Sire one-on-one -on -one most of the time. Maynard, acting primarily as a decoy, did not register a catch all game. Namath picked apart the Colts by spreading the ball to the rest of the team. Jets were on the brink of putting the Colts away. Namath left with an injured thumb while Unitas replaced Morrow. And it's ironical that the young fellow Namath went out with an injury and Unitas gets a, well, almost a standing ovation here, which he should. One of the greatest players in the history of pro football. I tell you, when Johnny Unitas came in the game, you're concerned at all of that. Get him, Big Green. Get him, Big Green. Unitas, instead of becoming the Colts' savior, nearly symbolize their desperation. Intercepted! Andy Beverly downs it. That's the fourth interception by the Jets in the game. And they have still shut out the mighty Colts. They were like a punch-drunk fighter who just got up after 10 rounds and he says, where is he? I can beat him. I know I can beat him. They were beaten. They were done. He may be sitting in one of sports' greatest upsets in history. Namath returned and led the Jets to one last score. In the final quarter, Namath put the game in the hands of number 41, fullback Matt Snell. Snell ate the clock, moved the chains, and propelled the Jets into history. They have upset the Baltimore Colts and beat them handily here today.
you gonna get a check for 15,000? I said, I don't want no check. I want mine and dimes. I want mine and dimes. I want to feel it. <laughs> the quarterback who nearly lost his team by being undisciplined had now won a championship by becoming the consummate team captain. Namath did not call a pass in the fourth quarter, yet he was the game's most valuable player. To me, Dave Herman and Matt Snell were two guys on our offense that carried that game. I did a good job, but MVP? Okay, we'll take it. I'm glad. Got to have confidence in your team. Got to have confidence in yourself. And if you don't have that confidence, you can't play football. We all felt we could win. We won. Baltimore felt they could win. They lost. Joe, you're king of the hill. No. No. We're king of the hill. We got the team, brother. America's Game is brought to you by IBM. What makes you special? After winning Super Bowl III, Joe Namath was asked if this should be considered an historic win. I don't know about that. I know it's a hell of a loss, but those folks would pick it the other way. <laughs> this time, the player who had become larger than life had sold himself short. Pro football would never be the same. The next week, we went up to the AFL All-Star Game. All those guys, they all just came up. Man, our life is great, y'all. We all beat them. The significance of that game for the players around the country, the other AFL players, how they felt, how their families felt, and how their fans felt, it was, it was really more than just the Jets winning against the Colts. We won for the league, the AFL. We got to see Pete Rizal. He said, fellas, that check that you got, he said, you're gonna spend that. He said, but that ring you're gonna get, he said, that's the intrinsic value. He said, the significance of that, nobody can ever take it away from you. That is the intrinsic value. And I never forget that. And I never used that word in my vocabulary before, but I used it ever since. The greatest Part, part of all was <laughs> that's, that's tough uh, I guess the fact really of just uh, the great teammates that you won and lost together celebrated and cried about ladies and gentlemen Joe Namath about 20 guys back here who won the world championship, but you can't see. I wish you'd stand up. Fellas, come on. This is our football team. A lot of guys here. The world championship football team. The same three words always come out when I looked at it. We did it. We did it. Every day in the locker room, doing training camp, doing a regular season, you know, teams, guys talk about winning. They want to win a championship. Well, we did it. it, it you know, I get goosebumps talking about it now. Doing it as an underdog is wonderful, too. There's a lot of underdogs out there in the world. And sometimes they need some reassurance that they can come back, man. Cop an attitude. Get mean and go do it. I like that.